We've got 10 big takeaways from the week that was for the Dodgers. Shohei Otani is exploding. Will the Dodgers really go to a six-man rotation when Walker Buehler returns? We have an update on Roki Sasaki, a jam-packed show here for Dodgers Dugout Live. That's coming up next. It's time for Dodger Baseball. And this How many times this team breaks my heart? I'll never stop loving the Los Angeles Dodgers. Big blue, bleed blue, and I'm out. What is up, Dodgers Nation? DMAC here, credential member of Dodgers Media. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. And we've got a jam-packed show for you here. Dodgers Dugout Live Monday edition. Everything you need to know in the world of Dodger baseball in less than an hour. The Dodgers, they take on the Twins today, a little after 4 o'clock Pacific time. We'll get you ready for that. But we got tons to get into. A jam-packed show. By the way, if you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to the Dodgers Nation YouTube channel. The number one Dodgers YouTube channel in the game hit that subscribe button hit that notification bell hit that like button also comment done down below so you're eligible for our next giveaway I believe it's going to be an authentic Mookie Betts jersey for the start that he's had but all you got to do to make sure that you're eligible for our giveaways is subscribe to the channel and comment done down below I see people talking about the solar eclipse yeah man I guess I won't see I'll have to wait till 2044 hopefully the Dodgers will have like 10 more World Series by that time but let's dive right into this comment section we got go dodgers bc we got bryce m says done we got troy reed advocate for trevor bauer we got uh, any games on during an eclipse we got bc bets otani freeman yeah we got tons of you guys comedy we got people talking about hank aaron yes this is the anniversary of hank aaron becoming the home run leader in major league baseball he's still my home run king mr hank aaron but let's dive into more of your comments guys what are your thoughts on this weekend's action for the dodgers look yes you lose two out of three you had terrible conditions in shy town but look a couple of great defensive plays by the Cubs I mean James Altman had a chance to tie things up there during the Friday game and yeah that great play there by Michael Bush by the way Michael Bush had himself one heck of a series against the Dodgers he was raking give him a lot of credit that had felt good for Michael Bush but let's dive into more of your topics more of your comments before we get into these topics by the way a reminder my super producer to my left, Mr. Antonio, he's killing it over there, and he's looking for your top comments that we will feature on the seventh inning stretch later in the show. So anything you got that's not related to the topics, throw it in there, and we'll get to it later. We got Johnny Owen. Gavin Stone just does not translate to wins in the rotation. Maybe the bullpen or trade route. Johnny Owen got some thoughts on Gavin Stone. Didn't have his best start. Lots of hard contact. You had, I mean, 10 bats that hit the balls against the Gavin Stone were hard contact, so that definitely wasn't good. But still, I mean, tons of really, really tough plays against him. I mean, look at that first inning, the error on Freddie Freeman that goes off the heel of his glove. Gavin Stone tries to make a play on it. Doesn't be, he's not able to make that play. And then unfortunately you saw he walked Swanson on five pitches. He had bases loaded two outs and Michael Bush. Bush just wasn't chasing that changeup out of the zone and he hits a double to the gap for three runs. So yeah, I mean, didn't have his best stuff. There's no doubt about it, but also really was impacted and effective negatively by some really tough defense behind him. I mean, I think that's kind of one of the big takeaways we'll get into. So a couple more, and we'll dive into these takeaways. We've got trade CT3 for DMAC. That's from Cesar. Yeah, I mean, 
I see people out there. They're bringing back some of the nicknames we were throwing out there last season. The swing and miss Chris, Chris Kaler. It's not that he's not really impacted that much by that as much as just not being able to really find a way to get results. I think you're seeing Chris Taylor's timing. The mechanics look a little off right now, and he's in one of those classic Chris Taylor slumps that you hope that he snaps out of very soon. We'll talk about the pitch clock, carnivorous lunar activity. F the pitch clock. It's gaining momentum. We'll talk about that. Juan Valdez, some of those Cubs defensive plays were one-offs. Yeah, you look at those defensive plays. I mean, Nico Horner, I mean, Dansby Swanson, they made some really fantastic plays against the Dodgers that helped that. We got Mike is a tad bit hot. DMAC, okay, we'll, uh, we'll pop one of those on for sure. We got Beezer. I hate to say this, but Outman should be sent packing for Oklahoma City. Okay, you're saying Outman get ready to speak OKC. Stone struggled again, becoming a pattern from BC. Gavin Lux is the problem. Always those soft throws. We'll talk about Gavin Lux. Joe Mama, DMAC, what do you think of Robo Umps? I think for me, the automated balls and strikes is what I'm here for because if you throw out a challenge and you have three challenges and that challenge is effective, you don't lose it, right? So I think for me, that was, that's the very first step. I mean, I've had a theory that the umpires, guys like Angel Hernandez, they're secret investors in the robo-umps, and that's why they've been awful in the last couple of seasons, dating back even longer than that because they know that they that is going to take over at some point. I think you're going to see it as soon as next. Season. That's what I've heard from some people around the league. Danny Cortez, it was an ugly game, ugly loss, ugly weather, and now it's out of the way. The game continuing in those conditions is what pisses me off, risking injuries. Yeah, I mean, when Miguel Rojas doesn't make a play, as Oral Hershiser pointed out, you know that it's not ideal conditions. And he said it was improper. That's what, that's what Miguel Rojas said about it. And I do think that, look, both teams had to play in those conditions. The Dodgers especially Sunday's game, especially that first inning. I mean, you had the air on Mookie. You had the air on Freddie. You had just sloppy defensive play. They just did not look sharp. They just didn't look like they wanted to be there. So I think all in all, it's early in the season in Chicago. You don't even have the Ivy out and it's par for the course, right? I mean, like I said, if it weren't for some great defensive plays by the Cubs, despite the weather, the Dodgers still could have taken two of three from Chicago. But let's dive in. Two, I like this. Avery, I'm down for this. Sign DMAG 10 years, $2 billion. I'll defer most of that money, just whatever it takes. Get me on the squad. I'll definitely hit better than some of the guys in the bottom of this lineup at the moment. No, I'm just playing. Those guys, I believe in them. I definitely do. But let's dive into it. So I got 10 big takeaways. We got a big Roki Sasaki update. We'll get into that. We'll get into a big Walker Buehler update. But 10 big takeaways from last week. The first one, the first one is... NBA Jam Sound, he's heating up. Shohei Otani is starting to go off. He's starting to catch fire. Last week, he had six extra base hits. He had his first two home runs with the Dodgers. He's had four consecutive two-hit games, two, four consecutive multi-hit games. He's slugging 833 last week. He drove in five runs. Now, I just want to point this out. He has four multi-hit games. I don't want to jinx him. Probably jinxed him by saying this. But the Dodgers' record is eight. It's held by two players, Duke Snyder and D. Gordon. So maybe Shohei Otani can make history and surpass that. I mean, he's definitely making it look easy right now. And what did I tell you guys last week? I said he was going to hit his first home run in the series against the Giants. I even tweeted out during the at-bat that he was going to hit that home run. He does it off of Rodgers, the first home run that Rodgers had given up to a lefty since 2021. And also said that he was about to go on a heater and he started to do just that he came into the week slashing 267 303 367 with an 85 weighted runs created plus just after a handful of games those numbers are up to from 267 to 320 so the batting average has jumped 53 points his on base is at 364 up from 303 the slugging has gone from 367 to 580 up 213 points and the weighted runs created plus which was at 15 percent below league average is now at 154 so plus 69 giggity plus 69 on the way he runs created plus. So he's starting to catch fire. I mean, you're just looking at the home run against the Cubs. I mean, against Hendricks, it's a, it's a, 
change up bottom of the zone you see the strength he just lifted that out over the wall in right field and you look at the season he had last season everyone was freaking out early in the year oh Shohei Otani what's wrong with Shohei Otani oh, he joins the Dodgers and he's struggling and all this and that it's Shohei Otani what's wrong with him last season when he won the MVP unanimously he was slugging to his expected batting average was 295 and you look at 2024 the expected batting average is at 375 the expected slug is higher this year it's at 707 last year it was at 638 if you look at the hard hit percentage it's around the same so he's actually gotten off to a better start than he did last season a season where he won the unanimous mvp so shohei otani He's really taking the baton from Mookie Betts as far as the hottest Dodger in the lineup. And I think that that is going to continue. This is someone who is as advertised. The least of your worries should always be Shohei Otani. You're starting to see him have a little more success against velocity up and in. You're seeing him barrel more balls in. The hard contact has just been there. So Otani has been incredible. And this is dealing with some off the field stuff with the betting scandal with eBay and all this stuff. He's still going Going out there and having success and now speaking of Shohei Otani my second big takeaway from last week is that good for the Dodgers good for the Los Angeles Dodgers for hopefully doing right for the fan that was on this show that is hopefully going to reconnect with the Dodgers go to a game and get what she wanted at the beginning which was just to meet Shohei Otani so I don't know if you guys saw the interview I did with Amber Roman the fan who caught Shohei Otani's first home run as a Dodger but she wasn't really happy about how things went down she told me that she was expecting a little more warmth from the Dodgers that she felt a little pressured into making her decision that they were threatening to not authenticate a ball that auctioneers and estimations have at anywhere from fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars well having said all that she was still okay with not getting the money she just wanted to meet Shohei Otani and the Dodgers executive vice president and chief marketing officer mr alon rosen he told bill plasky of the la times we're excited to host them again for a special night and give them a special dodger experience and we're going to review the process so not only are they going to bring her back and i'm just going to have to assume that shohei otani is going to connect with her maybe she'll get another bat another ball i was telling her to myself i was saying okay i hope that you look outside your window and you see a porch courtesy of Otani like he gave Joe Kelly's wife after Joe Kelly gave Otani number 17 not sure if she's gonna get a Porsche but all she wants is a pick with Otani it looks like she's gonna do just that but I hope they go above and beyond because look I mean at the end of the day she could have gotten 50 to a hundred thousand dollars had they just authenticated that ball Elias says DMAC Dunn North Hollywood yeah let me know where you represent Dodgers Nation from always excited to read the cities and also just comment on all the topics today so Otani on a heater they're fixing things with the fan that caught the ball love to see that like I said just give her a Porsche just give her a hundred K whatever it takes I mean come on we're nothing without our fans the Dodgers fans they make this organization what it is so I got uh, Dodgers Nation over here Antonio asked you guys what would you have asked for Shohei Otani's first home run I'll tell you what I would have asked for Antonio a 10 hour interview with Otani at his dugout at his clubhouse at his locker room that would be my thing probably take a Porsche probably take uh, for me honestly in reality like I would just want the game worn jersey like I'm a big jersey guy over a bat and baseball guy if I could get the game worn jersey that'd be me how about you what would you gun I mean that's pretty good uh pretty good idea I would just ask for the to throw the first pitch out of a game that's pretty bold I mean Antonio saying you know what forget the celebrities forget any athletes they have in that situation you want to throw out the first pitch that's a really good idea maybe they allow Amber Roman to throw that first pitch and they settle that way and he catches it they do the picture hey look you got so many games 162 game season cut that in half right you have multiple opportunities for that but for me i'm getting myself a jersey i'm getting myself a porsche and i'm getting myself an interview an exclusive interview with shohei otani now third big takeaway from last week third big takeaway from last week is yoshinobu yamamoto 
looks like the $325 million man that he was billed to be. Yamamania has officially begun. It was his second straight start with five scoreless innings. And what was so impressive was how he was able to escape not one, but two bases loaded jams there to start the game. He had bases loaded jams in the first two innings, and then he was dominant. He retired the last 10 batters that he faced. And after that first start, I'm old enough to remember, Antonio, remember after the the start against the Padres, Yamamoto's a bust. Yamamoto's not going to adjust to the baseball. It's too big for him. The mound's not going to work. He's not going to be able to do it in the pros. He's not going to do it in the big leagues. Yamamoto is a bust. Well, guess what? Just took him a couple starts after that, and you're seeing the dominant stuff. You're seeing world-class, top-shelf, nasty stuff. And really what stood out so far is not even the splitter, which is already, in my opinion, one of, if not the best splitter in all of Major League Baseball. It's that yo-yo curveball. I mean, you saw it in effect once again. I mean, he struck out the side... In the first, with Morrell with the curveball in the zone, he got Swanson looking at a perfectly painted fastball in the inside corner. Then he froze Bush with that yo-yo curveball on the outside corner. So with that curveball, what makes it so impressive is he can get it over and strike it early in counts and freeze hitters, or he can get swing and miss with it. He can work it towards the edges of the zone. And in the second, he got Madrigal swinging with the curveball, He and then he froze Belly with the curveball. So both those innings, you saw him freeze the hitter with the curveball, in Bush, in Belly, and then strike out the hitter with the curveball, with Madrigal swinging, with Morrell swinging. And then he found that splitter later, and it was starting to get really nasty at the bottom of the zone. But that curveball, like I'm saying, it's so fun to watch. I could watch it all day, every day. And he got 10 swinging strikes and called strikes on the curveball against the Cardinals. That was only the fourth time all year somebody had gone at least 10 swinging strikes or called strikes on the curveball. He had 14 on curveballs alone against the Cubs in just five innings. So you have 28 called strikes and swing strikes on the curveball this year. 28 called strikes and swing strikes on the curveball. Opponents are hitting .077. That pitch has been the best curveball in baseball so far, and it's not even considered to be his very best pitch. That happens to be his splitter. So, yeah, I mean, the one hit too, the one hit on the curveball, it's a play that could have been an error on Max Muncy. So, Yamamoto is the real deal. If you haven't bought stock, it's probably none left. I still think there's a world where he contends for the Cy Young this season, like I said, and runs away with the rookie of the year. My favorite thing, too, is after getting his first win, he got the beer shower, and it really feels like his teammates are just all in on him, just really wrapping their arms around him, embracing him. You got the beer shower. I love the beer shower, man. Give me a beer shower all day, every day. I mean, you got the probably a little burning, not the goggles happening, but it just really is a, a galvanizing moment. So, so impressed with Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Those haters that were saying he was going to be a bust, they're Homer Simpsoning back into the hedge, right? They're just not saying much right now because he looks like the real deal. And I think he's as good as any pitcher in the rotation, including Tyler Glass now, in my opinion. I think for him, what he needs to do is just find the command earlier in starts. He's doing a much better job on the edges, painting corners, but he's got to trust that fastball in the zone. It's a fastball with the arm side run. It's multiple planes. It's a filthy fastball. He just has to hit the corners with it early in starts, and I think you're going to see better outings from him where he's able to go six, seven innings. So Yoshinobu, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, he's the real deal. Yoshi, just like Mario, you got to jump on his back and he can carry this team. Next take, our fourth big take from last week in Dodger baseball. The bottom of the Dodgers lineup needs to step up. The bottom of the Dodgers lineup needs to get it together. If you have seen the bottom of the Dodgers lineup. Can you please return them to 1000 Vin Scully Avenue as soon as possible? Because they have been struggling essentially the entire season. And yes, you have a juggernaut at the top. You got the Mount Crushmore, as we're calling him here, Dodgers Nation, the MV3, as I've been calling him with Betts, Otani, and Freeman. But that's not going to be sustainable for an entire World Series run for a season where you want to win anywhere between 100, 120 games, 
if the bottom of your lineup is consistently lacking production. And that's what we're seeing right now. You guys know I bring my facts to the fight. Let's take a look here. James Altman, so far in the season, he's hitting 125 with a 34 weighted runs created plus. One extra base hit in 32 at-bats. He had a double the other day in the Dodgers, 9-7 loss on Friday. And look, tons of hard contact. He's hit the ball hard, had some loud outs. But I think with James Altman, you need to see him lift the ball more because hard contact on the ground is not going to find grass as much. And you see with his swing, sometimes it almost feels like a half swing the way he finishes it. I still believe he's capable of consistently doing damage and hitting at this level. I mean, last year he had 23 home runs, but as J.E. points out, Altman looks a little lost. And yeah, he does look a little lost at the plate, and you're seeing him just miss pitches, 94-mile-per-hour fastballs up and in. And you're seeing him miss pitches in the zone. That's when you start to get concerned, breaking balls down the way. I mean, you're seeing the way they're attacking him, and right now he just doesn't have an answer for that. But like I said, there has been some encouraging signs of life for him as far as there has been some hard contact, but you need to see more from James Outman. You don't want to see the James Droughtman, right? And I have all the belief in the world. This is a guy who works hard. He's someone that is not going to be outworked. I just, for his case, last year, like I said, my five stages of a big leaguer, the first stage, the dream is realized, right? You make your debut. Your family's there. They cut to the family. Everyone's crying and cheering when you make your first hit. You throw your first pitch. Stage two is prove you belong. I still believe that he's in the prove you belong stage. I think he can do it, but you need to see a little more consistency offensively because yeah, you makes you wonder, do you shorten that leash a little bit? Then you got Gavin Lux. Gavin Lux hitting 156 on the season. A 14 way to runs created plus. One extra base hit in 32 at-bats. And I think with Gavin Lux, I, you need 200 plate appearances. So I want to just kind of pump the brakes on everyone out there that want to pull the plug on Gavin Lux right now. I see that trending over all the social media platforms and people saying things like Gavin Lux, what's the point of him out there if he can't hit? Well, I think with Gavin Lux, he definitely needs just a little more time to go out there and prove that he can hit and kind of find a groove offensively. But should it be done at the big league level is kind of my question. Would he be better served playing at the minor league level where offensively you hope that he can find his rhythm, get his timing there and hopefully hit the ball hard. I mean, if you look at his baseball savant page, I mean, you look at the barrel percentage, he's in the one percentile hard hit percentage, the 20th percentile, the expected slug 24th percentile expected batting average 44th percentile. And also the big concern for me is the big justification for Gavin Lux at the bottom of this lineup was that he would serve as the Dodgers second leadoff hitter. He would get on base, provide another duck on the pond for the top of the order and score a ton of runs and use his dynamic speed. Well, if you look at his sprint speed so far this season, he's in the 13th percentile. In sprint speed. So that tells me that he still needs some time to get fully recovered from that knee injury. And it really makes you wonder, is Gavin Lux at second and Mookie Betts at shortstop the best in-house option for the Dodgers right now? Because the way that Miguel Rojas has found a way to have some success at the plate early on, defensively we know he's a top five to ten defensive shortstop he's more than respectable at the position he can get the job done at above average level so the other day Mookie Betts I mean ball hit to him yes it stayed on the ground because the dirt was a little wet but it's just the wear and tear is going to catch up on him I'm not an advocate for Mookie Betts being the Dodgers starting shortstop I'm just not because what he does best at this point of his career, his biggest strength, the most value he provides for this team is what he can do at the plate. Mookie's cooled off a little bit, right? Can he have an MVP season at the plate and do what he does at the shortstop position where he has graded out as a slightly above average shortstop defensively and he deserves all the credit in the world for that. He's capable of it, but then how much gas will he have left in the tank when it comes to to October. I mean, he's going to be like your cell phone when you're on vacation and you're at like 4% 
and you can't charge it and you don't have the external charger and you're just like always looking to charge your phone. I want a fully green 80, 90, 100% Mookie bets for the postseason. I'm just not so sure that. And then you go down the line. Chris Taylor is hitting 48 with a five weighted runs created plus. So I'm not too concerned about Chris Taylor just because the Dodgers know what he is. He knows what he is. He is a streaky, streaky hitter. I mean, it just takes one at bat, one game, then all of a sudden Chris Taylor looks like the hottest hitter in baseball for a couple weeks on end. They know the role he has. It's the versatility he brings. If a guy goes down, you can plug him in. But look, the bottom line is that production is bad, and that brings me to a player that I have been known to be extremely fond of. If there are no more fans of this man, I will no longer be on this earth and of course, I'm talking about Miguel Vargas. Miggy Varg has really gotten off to a great start down in AAA. Nine games so far for OKC. He leads the entire team with three home runs, 15 RBIs, slugging 618, has a 151 weighted runs created plus, a 14.3 walk percentage. So Miguel Vargas, with the versatility that this team has with Teoscar Hernandez, you can play at both corner outfield spots. With Mookie Betts, you can play short second, both uh, corner right field, right? If you look at some of the versatility this team has, look, Miguel Vargas, he could be a plus bat down the lineup. I mean, this is someone who, let's not forget, a couple years ago, we were saying he has the best hit tool at the minor league level. And you've seen him go back to basics. I've talked to Miguel Vargas about this. And for him... There was just too much thinking at the big league level. And he made that very clear to me that it was just about going back to his natural swing, a little more east to west, covering both sides of the plate, just going out there and trying to just get hard contact. He was pressing at the big league level because I think that he was getting a little too much from the hitting coaches, a little too much from other players, and just trying to press because he had so much runway as the starting second baseman to start the year. I also think second base just wasn't the best position for him. He graded out poorly at that position. Now that he has a little more stability as a player that knows he's going to be in the outfield, and offensively, yes, there's a big gap between big league pitching and minor league pitching at the triple a level but still those results tell me that miguel vargas if this continues with the bottom of the lineup he deserves an opportunity to get called up and see what he can do because you just can't have this for an entire season i mean you have to explore your options if the entire bottom third of your lineup is hitting under 200 you just can't justify having gavin lux occupy that second base position. James Allman occupied that center field position on an everyday level. If that's the numbers they're posting, I think you have to consider platooning and then you consider some other options. Also point out, I mean, Trey Sweeney, they have met third down at the minor league level. He's got some opportunities. We saw Andy Paz has had a great spring. Maybe he gets his opportunity. They could easily look elsewhere for an outfielder during the season. But yeah, look, the bottom of the lineup, I'm going to give you your 200 plate appearances, but I think that leash could get a little shorter. So let's dive into the comments here. Here you guys have to say about that bottom of the order. You got Michael Carrillo. I'd rather have Vargas in the bigs than Lux right now. Michael Carrillo. I mean, look, I, I defensively Lux has looked apart. The There's no doubt about it, but the speed, I just think for what's best for Gavin Lux, right? That's my question. What's best for Gavin Lux? Is it, to hit a buck 50 to two to 175 in the show with limited pop and below average sprint speed numbers and just trying to figure it out on the fly and hope that one day you have a three for four game you take off or is it really starting the process the right way i mean walker bueller is down in triple a right getting his way back and is an all-star caliber pitcher i know it's different as far as rehab starts versus a position player but i definitely think there could be some benefit for that obviously he wants the big league money and the service time but what's best for gavin lux what's best for the dodgers i think it's premature at the moment i absolutely think that is way too much of a knee-jerk reaction to send him down or do anything like that right now but let's see where we're at around 100 to 150 200 plate appearances and if the numbers are the same then i think you have to explore some options we got uh BC, can Pajes or Vargas replace CT3's bat in the lineup? At least the games we have, Lux and Barnes in the lineup. There's so many holes in the lineup you can have to expect to produce runs. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, with Vargas, you have another bench bat, too. Uh, a guy who is going to make his money at the big league level at the plate with his stick. 
And that's what Vargas does best. And I think that Vargas has learned a lot. I mean, this is someone who I think benefited from being sent down last season towards the all-star break and never making it back. He really got back to his roots and you're seeing it early on for him. But coming up next here on Dodgers dugout live, we got a big update on Dodgers target. Mr. Roki Sasaki, the number one prospect on the planet that could be the Dodger next season. We'll talk about him next here on Dodgers dugout live. What, what up, Dodgers, Dodgers Nation? Nation D-Mac, D-Mac here. Here to remind, remind you that if you have, have not yet, be sure to subscribe to the number one Dodgers YouTube channel for all the Dodgers news, rumors, hype videos, interviews, breakdowns, live streams, and more all year long. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. And if you want to help the channel out, smash that like button. Also, you will not be eligible for any of our giveaways unless you are subscribed to the channel. So all you need to do to be eligible for all of our giveaways is just make sure that you are subscribed. We just gave away a brand new authentic Mookie Betts jersey valued at over $350. And we've got tons of giveaways coming this offseason. So be sure to be subscribed so you are eligible to win. And as always, think blue, bleed blue, and please subscribe. And welcome back to Dodgers Dugout Live here on the Dodgers Nation YouTube channel, the number one YouTube channel for your Los Angeles Dodgers. If you haven't yet, do us a huge favor and hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. And if you really love your Los Angeles Dodgers, if you really want them to get Roki Sasaki, if you really want to support the channel, smash that like button. Also comment done down below so you're eligible for our next giveaway at 90,000 subscribers. Got some more comments here. We got Johnny Owen over on YouTube. Bring up Andy Pajes and Miguel Vargas. What we have to lose. We've got Luis Gonzalez. Well, what you have to lose, the answer to that question is you could possibly hurt Gavilux's confidence early on by pulling the plug on it. So that's something that you could lose. So I definitely think that they're going to explore some options that they don't produce. I mean, that's just the truth of the matter. We got Miggy at shortstop and Mookie at second base. That's from Luis Gonzalez. Lindsey Balmer, Lux Outman, and Taylor's batting average combined is about the same average as Rojas. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, very small sample size. It absolutely is a small sample size. But Miguel Rojas, if you date back to the end of last season in September, even even there were some signs in August, Miguel Rojas has just looked better at the plate. He's given you a professional big league at bat. And if you look at his numbers so far this season, I mean, he has he's hitting 313, a 170 weighted runs created plus, and two home runs. I mean, he has the same amount of home runs as Shohei Otani, right? So he is clearly as good of a home run hitter as Shohei Otani, right? But yes, it's only 16 plate appearances, right? That is an absurdly small, absurdly small size. But Angelo says, give Lux a hug. We got uh, Justin Lamba saying that that he's a that that Vargas is a 4A player. Lux is this is from Mr. Classic. Dave platooning shortstop is not correct. Hepatitis. See you later. Should have left Grove at Canes. <laughs> uh, we got Chris Saint Jacques. Let Lux get reps at the shortstop position in Triple A and get his bat right. Yeah, I mean. It might not be the worst thing for him in the world down the line. I don't think they're going to go back to trying him at shortstop this season, though. Andrew Friedman told me basically as much in Korea. So I don't think they're going to revisit that this year. We got Big Dog. What up, Fabian? Lux is also a 4A player from Justin Lombas. By the way, if a 4A player with Justin Lombas means is it's kind of in between being a big leaguer and a triple-A player. So, yeah, I mean, I think that Miguel Vargas has a big league bat. I truly do believe that. Remember, he's extremely young. RC 22. Well, I wouldn't say extremely long, young, but he's young considering the experience that he has and this opportunity. I mean, he turned 24 back in November. So he still has time to figure things out and reach that potential. We got RC. Oh my God. Sasaki in the mix of three musketeers for Japan. LOL. I'm all for that. Okay. So let's dive into that one. A quick update on Roki Sasaki. So I hope you guys one day when we sign Roki Sasaki that you'll remember who the first Dodgers podcast and Dodgers YouTube channel to mention him was two years ago when we were interviewing Jose Moda and we're breaking down the Japanese pitchers and how he was someone that could be a Dodger one day. And we are going to follow all things Roki Sasaki all year long because he's that big of a prospect. Like I said, not just the best pitching prospect, he is the top prospect in all of Major League Baseball. And we have a little update, and that is that five MLB scouts. Let me get this one right, because I want to give credit to this guy to make sure. 
but five MLB scouts were in attendance. We're in attendance. This is from Yaku Yaku Cosmopolitan. Yaku Cosmopolitan, a publication that covers Japanese baseball. And they tweet out five MLB scouts, Dodgers, Cardinals, Cubs, Rangers, and Reds were reportedly in attendance to watch Roki Sasaki throw a career high 111 pitches this afternoon. Now, interesting note on his outing well what 111 pitches i see people out there saying oh why are they doing that why are the chiba lote lote marines why are they abusing roki sasaki are they just trying to take advantage of him and trying to drive him like a rented car knowing he's going to be gone no they do that in japan i mean last season yamamoto his second start he threw 107 pitches so it's extremely par for the course for pitchers in Japan to throw more than 100 pitches even during this time of the year. We saw last year Yamamoto. We saw that with Imanaga. This is nothing that's out of the ordinary. But what does stick out, though, is Roki Sasaki hasn't thrown a pitch, hasn't thrown a fastball that's exceeded 99 miles per hour this year. His average pitch velocity is down 1.8 miles per hour. And he said after the game, I'm not too tired because my ball hasn't been very, very fast lately. And he's made it very clear that him and the Marines, they're trying to complete the season without an injury this year. So maybe they're trying to slow the fastball down. He's not going at max effort just to try to reduce the fatigue a little bit, just slow down the velocity so he can enter the market and hopefully sign with the Los Angeles Dodgers. So look, I mean, I wouldn't say that's too shocking, but it's definitely something to monitor this season because when he's right, he's over a hundred miles per hour. He's sitting triple digits. He's sitting 98, 99, a hundred. And that's what makes him so explosive that and that splitter and just how dominant he is on the mound. So look, the Dodgers were in attendance. You had the Cardinals, Cubs, Rangers, and Reds, but it does feel like the Dodgers are in pole position to acquire Roki Sasaki if he is made available. I mean, they've already made it pretty clear that he probably does have that clause in his contract like Shohei Otani had where he can get out before get, being officially posted for the six years and being 25 and everything he needs to do to get posted. So if that's the case, I mean, my mouth is watering just thinking of Roki Sasaki, Shohei Otani, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. I mean, that's just unbelievable. You're talking about the three best pitchers in Japan on the same team in the same rotation. I mean, that would be historic. That'd be once in a sport level stuff. I mean, just unbelievable to think of Roki Sasaki potentially on the Dodgers join those two, but good to see the Dodgers are doing their due diligence and making sure that they're there scouting. It always helps when they know it's almost like recruiting in college, right? When you're recruiting in college, the more time that player, you know, he's at his high school gym and he has a big game, 30, 40 points. He sees the assistant coach there sitting in the fourth row in the bleachers. They remember that kind of stuff when they make their decision. Now, next big takeaway Walker Bueller dominated in his last rehab start. So number eight, Walker Bueller has dominated in his last rehab start. He's continuing to check off boxes Saturday night in OKC's four to three win over Albuquerque. He retired the first nine batters that he faced. He gave up just two hits, no runs or walks. So he gave up two hits with no runs and no walks. He had six strikeouts and four and two thirds innings of work. The four seam fastball, it was around 94 miles per hour. He topped out at 95.9 miles per hour. And he said after the start, I don't really think I have much doubt about my abilities. If I'm healthy to go and get people out, he went three and a thirds innings in his last rehab start. And that one didn't look as good. He gave three hits, uh, Three hits, he allowed four runs, three earned, including a home run and two walks. He struck out two batters. So that's definitely really, really promising. You also say people don't really understand. You can come back from Tommy John in 12 or 14 months, but I think it's not really there until 18 or 24 months. I experienced that with my first one, and this one is no different in that I started playing catch again. I felt way better and just smoother and better. So he's going to continue to build up. They want to ramp him up to 90 to 100 pitches. He could join the Dodgers back towards the end of April. And I think 
everyone out there, they want to see a six-man rotation. I think that would benefit them. With Gavin Stone, it makes you wonder if they do send him down and then you kind of go with this kind of unofficial six-man rotation or you have the bullpen games mixed in there. That probably is what they're going to lean towards doing because Gavin Stone, he hasn't pitched bad. He really hasn't. I mean, everyone's talked about his start yesterday. Let's not forget those three runs in the first. Those were unearned runs because of that error on Freddie Freeman. Gavin Stone's numbers on the year. He has a 4-5 ERA, a 195 FIP, though. The 195 FIP, 12.4 strikeouts per nine. The BABIP is at 423. So he's had a lot of bad luck. I still believe in Gavin Stone. I absolutely believe in Gavin Stone and still think he could be a big contributor to this team. But I think you want to see... It's a lot of really hard stuff, right? Not really hard, but you're seeing at 95, 96 or that changeup at around 87 and then the cutter or the two seamer see at 91, 92. It'd be nice if you had the slider. It'd be nice if you had more of that curveball to really change speeds. That's something that I think would benefit him. But I do think that with Walker Buehler returning, probably going to see a five man with the bullpen games as opposed to a six man, but that's just how I'm feeling right now. Now, next big takeaway we got, we're at number, number nine pitcher injuries are hurting baseball. And it's more of a national topic right now. Pitchers injuries are absolutely a serious problem for this league. Shane Bieber, he went down and he has to undergo Tommy John surgery. You saw Spencer Strider. It looks like he is someone that could be in line for a serious surgery himself. Garrett Cole, he's been on the shelf. I mean, you just have so many examples of top brand name star pitchers. They're losing. And I think there's a lot of different factors. I see people talking about the pitch clock and yes, the major league baseball players association, they sent out a memo kind of blaming the pitch clock, or at least saying the pitch clock has something to do with it. And the fact that major league baseball even wanted to reduce the pitch clock. I think the pitch clock could be a factor. I mean, you look at it. I mean, should guys, does the human arm really have the ability to throw 90 to 95 miles per hour every 10 to 15 seconds? And then you throw in that they're not, crazy spin with curveballs and sliders and cutters and things like that. It could be a factor, but I think it really stems more from the velocity revolution. If you look at the average velocity, it's gone from 91.8 miles per hour to 93.8 miles per hour. That is the average. And when you have guys going max effort, every single pitch searching for max spin, every single pitch, the human, it's a ticking time bomb. It's a ticking time bomb. Like Billy Bean said, it's two types of pitchers. Ones that have had Tommy John surgery, ones that are going to have Tommy John surgery. And you've seen the number go up from 34% Major League Baseball all the way up to 40%, right? So I think what it comes down to is which organization, speaking of Moneyball, which organization is going to value pitchers' health and arm health versus high velocity and just max velocity. I mean, it's a tough question because here's the thing. Let's say you have a guy that has, he's healthy. He can pitch for an entire 162 game season, but his ERA is between four and five. Or do you take the guy with a sub four ERA that does go max velocity and is kind of playing with fire, right? I think that teams realize that hitters are so good now in Major League Baseball. You have seven guys in lineups that can hit home runs. It wasn't like that back in the day. You'd have seven guys leaving the yard. Maybe it was three or four. Now you have seven, eight guys that can hit home runs. And to get those guys out, you need premium pitching. So if people think the answer out there is to not go after velocity, well, then what happens? Hitters are going out there and they are pounding pitching so is the answer to dead in the ball i don't know is the answer to move them out closer to home plate i don't know i mean do you want to give pitchers more of an advantage i'm not so sure i mean this is from jeff by the way if you haven't read jeff passon's book the arm i highly recommend it and i think the real problem as a lot of people have pointed out and not a lot of people are really talking about right now though is it starts at the youth level and you're seeing young pitchers throwing too hard, too much breaking stuff at too young of an age. And Jay, you got, uh, you got, uh, Dr. Andrews, right? I mean, this is the probably the most famous, uh, surgeon, right? Dr. James Andrews. 
And he said in 2015, he estimated he did 80 to 90 surgeries that year, right? Back in 2000, he was doing one or two. Now he's in 2015, he did 80 or 90. And that kids that regularly pitch with arm fatigue, they're 36 times likelier to undergo elbow or shoulder surgery. So, I mean, it starts at the youth level. I mean, it really does. I mean, they, well, by the time that these pitchers are at the minor league level, they're already damaged goods. They're already a ticking time bomb because of what happened when they were in their youth leagues and in their college days. It just, it doesn't make sense. And look, honestly, in college at this point, if you guys know at the college level, if you're a coach that makes your starting pitcher go out there and throw hundred, 120 pitches, you're asked to get fired, right? I mean, that's kind of the culture now, but you really wonder if younger pitchers are being just overly taxed at an early age. And that's really the problem. I think that truly is the problem. I think major league baseball, they need to get involved at the youth level and they need to try to see what they can do to kind of put a stop to this and try to limit all that. But it's hurting baseball. Let's not kid yourself. I mean, imagine if you're watching the NFL and all these brand name quarterbacks are going down every single year. Yes, you have injuries in the NFL. Yes, you have injuries in the NBA. But still, right now, pitchers injuries, it is a problem. I think you're also seeing the the flat arm syndrome too. the release points are hurting as well. I mean, I don't know if you saw Justin Verlander had some very interesting comments about that. Just kind of a more traditional kind of overhand really helps them. But I mean, I mean, look at, uh, look at Randy Johnson. I mean, Randy Johnson, I mean, he had 92 mile per hour slider, hundred mile per hour fastball, pitched over 400 innings in his 21 year career. And in his second to last season, he threw 184 innings. Now, he had a big advantage because he was 6'10", and he was really tall. He didn't have a weird arm angle. But I think that's kind of something that needs to be visited, too. The arm angles, I think, are a factor. It's never just one thing. It's always a little more nuanced than that. But the thing that is important is just realize that this is an absolute problem for Major League Baseball that needs to be addressed. But there we go. Ten big takeaways from last week. Now we're going to hit the seventh inning stretch where we answer all your most pressing Dodgers-related questions, really any question at all you can throw it out there so let's hit the seventh inning stretch and let's answer your questions before we head out of here on a monday a monday edition of dodgers dugout live we got bc gratterall doesn't have to juice up his mechanics to throw 100 plus neither does chapman if you can do it naturally trying to of course will f up your elbow look at Degrom. yeah i mean that's look some guys can do it some guys can't and the average velocity has just gone up and everyone's chasing velocity, everyone's chasing spin, but I think it's a risk they're willing to take because, because the uh, because they want to find a way to get paid, right? I mean, that's just the the truth there. I mean, you want to go out there and find a way to get paid. And if you say, okay, maybe if I get one or two Tommy John surgeries to do it, then I'll do it because we've seen guys come back there and have that success. But uh, we got DMAC. What's Sasaki's best pitch he throws? I mean, if you saw the WBC, he averaged 100.5 miles per hour on that fastball, can pump it up to 102. So, I mean, look, I don't care what anyone says, the best pitch in Major League Baseball is still, it's still a well-located fastball. But also, I mean, <laughs> the splitter is crazy too. I mean, the velocity is going to be where everything sits, but that splitter... If you look at the drop, that's his best pitch. Okay, that is his very best pitch because I'm you're talking about a splitter that not only does it move more than a military family, I mean, this thing, it drops over 30 inches, 30 inches, and the velocity it sits at is 91.2 miles per hour. He's actually hit 93 on his splitter before. So just imagine someone just brought up Jacob DeGrom. Imagine DeGrom's fastball slider velocity ratios there. That's kind of what you're thinking of with Roki Sasaki, only that it's not a slider, it's a splitter. The vertical break, 31.4 inches. It's dropped as much as 37 inches. I mean, we're talking about over three feet, okay? <laughs> I can talk about Roki Sasaki all day, every day. I mean, you talk about dropping off a table, this is the epitome of that. Then we got Zella Zoom, Yamamoto, Sasaki, Otani, one, two, three in the rotation would be crazy. 
of all the other amazing arms Freeman is working on to make his rotation deep. I agree with that. Let's hit some more down below before we head out of here, guys. At least he's building up losers like the Lakers. Okay. We got the Mr. Classic. They had Yamamoto and Otani on the radar since high school. Yeah, Mr. Classic. I mean, Friedman has been there multiple times. He said on this show that no one is developing pitchers better right now than Japan. And they understand that. And I think, like I said, I mean, he had 111 pitches in his last start. The velocity was down a little bit, but they know what they're doing out there as far as managing workloads and ramping their pitchers up. Jay Bullets, the team with the best bullpens, tend to win the World Series. I mean, yeah, Lion. I mean, it's increasingly become a bullpen game. Look at that Braves team a couple years ago. And I think if you want to throw in a quick other takeaway, without Bruce Dark Gratterall, this bullpen's feeling thin, and they're playing the DFA game with Denelson Lamette and Nabil Krismat and trying to find ways to supplement this bullpen. But the soonest they can get Bruised Dar back is May 18th. They need the bazooka back in a hurry. I think that you're starting to gain a little more appreciation with him out. But uh, hepatitis, see you later. The Reds and Cardinals are trying to be involved. LOL. I know. The Reds kind of threw me out. <laughs> I get, Roki Sasaki ain't going to the Reds. Okay, I'm just going to put that out there. All right? Come on now. We got uh, Nando. Nando. Love Bueller rocking it, Dr. Cole. Yeah, I mean, so excited to have Bueller back. I think Butane is the man on a mission. Cubs won the Bush trade. Nando 390. We'll talk about that tomorrow. It's still extremely early, but you got to give Michael Bush a ton of credit. Michael Bush is someone that was supposed to rake at the big league level because of his hit tool. And he's done just that with the Cubs. I mean, a 133 weighted runs created plus a home run in 32 plate appearances, hitting 296. He's got a good spot, though. I mean, it's a good problem for them to have is, okay, we know where to place him. And that's at the first base spot. Dodgers, they had the problem. They couldn't do it. BMW, Mercedes, poor stats from Roberto Hernandez. Yeah, maybe we'll do that tomorrow. We'll do every uh, player in which car they'd be. DMAC is Sasaki contract over this year, 2024. It's not that. I mean, they... For him, he just needs the Chibalote Marines who could get a lot more money if they were able to wait till they get his true posting fee like Yamamoto did, right? Yamamoto had a true posting fee and he signed for $325 million. But if they let him out sooner than that, he's going to sign on a minor league contract, which is you're sitting around $5 million and you're playing a minor league deal. So that's what makes it really, really advantageous for the Dodgers to be able to get that considering how much payroll they're already dealing with but uh how long do we keep kyle hurt down to the bullpen where it is chris i think i want to see kyle hurt back in the mix yesterday i said it uh, over on twitter is the wolverine meme where he's patting the picture missing the days of kyle hurt because you can go multiple innings you can work in the zone i think the fact they use the option early on him tells you that they know he's going to be a part of this bullpen later so i think that that was their way of telling you that that they think okay we're not afraid of using all five up early on because we expect him to be in this pen for an extended period of time. So it's only a matter of time because Michael Grove, Michael Grove has been, I mean, I don't know how to say it in a nice way, but Michael Grove has been awful. He's been, a, uh, he's been bad so far for the Dodgers team. And I don't think that they're going to prolong that. I think that they're going to address that pretty quickly here, but uh, yeah, you guys are firing in the comments. We're going to do this show. We're going to be like a 10 hour show. All these questions you guys have uh, should have kept Bush, man, dude killed us. Look, I think that it was just wasn't the greatest fit defensively. I mean, if he had proven out to be... I think there was also a little bit of a sunk cost fallacy. I mean, he was a, a high pick, right, out of, coming out of North Carolina. So they had incentive to do that. But don't forget about Jackson Ferris, the prospect they got in return. They don't have to have him on the 40-man roster. You need to replenish the farm system from that standpoint. But, yeah, I mean, could it be, to me, I think it could be a Paul Canerco. You guys remember Paul Canerco when the Dodgers traded Paul Canerco for Jeff Shaw? Or, or Paul Canerco back in the day. I mean, Paul Canerco to the Dodgers, that one definitely hurt. So hopefully it's not a, a situation like that. Yeah, I remember that. I mean, I remember that day like it was yesterday. Paul Canerco for Jeff Shaw just popped into my mind. Jeff Shaw was a good closer, though, for a while, but <laughs> wasn't as good a career that uh, Paul Canerco had, I'll tell you that much. But uh, uh, the big chorizo is from uh, Antonio over here. Uh, Bush over Freddie is not the take. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Amen to that. You have Freddie Freeman, who is a Hall of Fame hitter. By the way, fun fact about Freddie Freeman. You know he's actually the active leader in Major League Baseball in hits? Think about that since Mickey Cabrera retired. But I think we'll end on that note. Just a final note here, a little walk-off shot, is that, look, this team, the whole five-run streak, by the way, 
the five run streak is over. Of course, they had the four run streak. And then yesterday, of course, they even didn't score four runs. But the Dodgers, they had scored five plus runs in each of their first 10 games of the season. That was tied for the most ever in National League history to open up the season. The only major league team to score more in more games was the 1932 Yankees who scored five or more runs in their first 13 games. Yeah, that's great. But my final thought is that's not sustainable. Okay, you're not going to have that for the entire course of a season. You're not going to average almost seven runs a season. And most importantly, that's not going to translate to the postseason. We saw that last year. 906 runs in the regular season. What happened? They didn't show up. The bats struggled in the postseason. So let's not rely on these five-run offensive explosions. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it feels good. It's like watching an all-star game, right? But they need to find a way to have a little more consistency, with the bullpen when they get healthy, not a good start for Bobby Miller. Gavin Stone, not great defense behind him, but let's focus on the run prevention. Sloppy defense, errors by Mookie and Freddie Freeman, right? So let's focus a little more on the run prevention. That's my walk-off shot today. The five-run streak is over, and it could be a good thing for the Dodgers. But that's going to do it for this episode of Dodgers Dugout Live. My name is Doug McCain. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. Special shout-out to my producer, Mr. Antonio, to my left, finding all your comments down below. Do a couple walk-off comments here. Gil, I'm a Mexican Dodgers fan, and every year my wife and I travel to LA to see our Dodgers play. We're going to be on the in the game on July 9th, 13th in Yoshi's bobblehead game. This year is going to be Art Yars. Awesome, man. You come here from Mexico for Yamamoto's bobblehead game, and that's his first bobblehead, so that's always going to be special. But uh, thanks again, guys. Remember, nothing brings us together quite like Dodger baseball. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Hit that like button. And until next time.